Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Goethe Centrum first official Zoom. In these new ages, we are now with the novel coronavirus in the new age um, as it is, and uh, we look forward to uh, launching our Zoom sessions and webinars with this particular program. Thank you for being with us. In this age, we are all in the process of reinventing ourselves, our environment, our work, and of course, our priorities. At Goethe Centrum Hyderabad, which is dedicated to promote German language and culture, we have switched to teaching all our courses at all levels via online with a faculty that has adapted itself swiftly and professionally. As I said, Kunst Forum, this particular session will launch our online session. Kunst Forum is a word which means literally art talk. And this is a platform where we have in the past invited artists, curators, art historians. In this continuation of the tradition that Goethe Centrum has, we are very happy that we have Dr. Sharda Natarajan with us on this webinar. <clears throat> this session of Kunz Forum will lead to six further sessions. I will come to that a little later. And details of this are available on view. At the end of this session, there will be a slide as well as via email and on our website. Dr. Sharda Natarajan did her BA in Fine Arts from Chennai, moving on to MS University in Baroda for her master's as well as her PhD. Her doctoral thesis, which she completed in 2006, is titled Framing Modern Indian Art, Art and History. For her postdoctoral study, she spent close to a year at the Humboldt University in Berlin. She's an academic, research scholar, and a teacher of art history. Her area of expertise is medieval Indian sculpture and iconography and Indian art historiography. At this moment, she is part of an expert team of sacred ensembles of Hoysala, which is part of the task taken on by India Intac in Bangalore, the Department of Archaeology project, which is conducted by the government of Karnataka. Before I hand over to Dr. Sharda Natarajan to take us through the corridors of art and aesthetics on the title, Learning to Look, Indian Art History and the German Legacy, I'd like to run through a quick brief on the format of this session. Dr. Natarajan will speak in two parts. We will collect questions. Feel free to please write them on the chat box here, or if you have joined us on the YouTube live, please jot them down there. We will collect and collate, and I'd be very happy to present these questions to Dr. Natarajan at the end of her talk. We also request you to please remain muted at all times of the session and as well keep your video off. This will enhance the quality of the transmission. Apologies for the very slight delay in starting, but here we are with Dr. Sharda Natarajan. And thank you, Sharda, for being with us and look forward to this talk. Over to you. Thank you. Is my screen coming on? My slides coming on? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, wonderful. And can you can hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. 
So good evening to all viewers from various parts of the country and various parts of the world. This is uh, for all of us a completely new experience talking into uh, a screen. Um, luckily, we have a few uh, faces on the side that we can see. So it's, it's not as interactive as uh, the classes that we're used to and we're used to a lot more interaction in um, the sessions, but we try and make do with what we have. And uh, we, uh, I really am so happy that uh, Greta Zencham Hyderabad could actually put together this uh, series of presentations uh, in the midst of what is a fairly uh, alarming crisis. And um, so to make the most of this wonderful session, thank you so much, uh, Amita Desai and her team for putting together putting together this uh, wonderful session. And um, so today we will look very briefly at what the discipline of art history actually means to uh, Indian art historians. Uh, I'm not talking for all art historians, but in some sense what it means to a lot of us who studied in some of the institutions and are working on specific research projects and also teach art history in India. And linking it up, uh, with uh, a series of German speaking art historians who were crucial to our development as art historians when we studied about 25 years ago in uh, MS University of Baroda, which was one of the premier institutions. So we were grilled in uh, quite a bit of uh, art history theory. And among the prominent art historians we were looking at in those days were uh, a group of German and German speaking art historians. So in some sense, I'm not an expert on German art historians or on art theory in Germany. My area of expertise is I'm a medievalist. I look at medieval Indian architecture and sculpture. And I'm, I'm also very interested in art historiography and art pedagogy. So what I have done is actually uh, by way of um, communicating, uh, paying a kind of tribute to the art historians, the German art historians, not as an expert, but as somebody who has learned a lot from looking at specific German art historians who have been very influential in changing the way we look at art, think about art. So the learning to look is really part of that, uh, the process that was taught to me by a series of my mentors, of course, in MS University of Baroda, but also the art historians uh, from Germany and German speaking art historians who absolutely pioneering uh, institution, institutions in themselves and they changed the nature of the discipline and made it modern. So learning to look is, uh, begins with what does it mean to look at an extremely complex art object like I've just used a, a very beautiful sketch of Elora. This is the Kailas Temple, Cave 16. And um, you can see uh, the very interesting details that have been given on the thing, a little bit of native color, local color with some natives um, in the background to give you scale, as well as to give you a kind of sense of location. And the whole idea of, um, a remarkable romantic quasi ruin. It's not a perfect work of art, it's a kind of ruin. And this was much appreciated amongst uh, the first set of uh, English language writers who wrote about um, Indian ob objects. Um, the Curiosities and Wonders crowd, uh, including John Seeley, who talks about the wonders of Elora and he kind of waxes eloquent about the beauties of Elora's um, evoking the sublime in Elora's uh, wonders. So here, I'd like to read a small excerpt. Within the court opposite these galleries or verandas stands Kailas the proud, wonderfully towering with hoary majesty. To conceive for a moment the body of men, however numerous, with a spirit however invincible and resources however great, attack a solid mountain of rock in, with a chisel. Yeah? 
I think the caverned uh, temples of Elora far surpass in labor design and any, uh, any of the ancient buildings that we've already seen. So now he talks about, he talks in a typical sort of hyperbolic romantic mode about the bewilderment, the amazement, the sublimity and the wonder evoked by um, the Elora itself. And that is a very acknowledged aesthetic frame uh, within which romantic writers wrote about various um, objects of wonder, very often mingling nature with uh, the uh, man-made object. And that was that slippage was actually very much part of the romantic frame of looking at uh, things like ruins. And of course, they liked ruins better than they liked um, perfectly modern, clean, neat buildings with no uh, pieces falling off or um, plants growing over them. And so, and this particular view is um, again hyperbolic, and the very word wonder suggests that it, it is part of uh, the romantic genre. Now take a look at this by contrast. James Ferguson, writing shortly afterwards, says, in reality, it's considerably easier and less expensive to excavate a temple than to build one. Take, for instance, the Kailas. To excavate the area on which it stands would require the removal about, of about um, 100,000 cubic yards of rock. And the question is simply whether it's easier to chip away. So he's doing this amazing. The excavating process would probably cost about one tenth of the other. So it's, it's really remarkable how you have two completely diverse views of a single monument. And within Elora, it's the Kailas that we're talking about, the Cave 16 Kailas. And within a few, you know, uh, within less than 100 years of each other, 50 years of each other, they're talking, two men, both from Britain, are talking of two entirely, almost like they're talking about two entirely different objects, art objects. So what is it that makes uh, two people from the same origins, from the same culture, speaking the same language, and within a very short time of each other, responds in diametrically opposite ways to um, a monument that we all know stands as you know a world heritage site and something that we're all familiar with. So this is actually the core problem that I dealt with in my um, uh, PhD thesis. And for this, I would like to quote a little poem that I was reading a few days ago. And it's, one, it's, uh, it's a poem about my favorite, one of my favorite parables. It was six men of Indostan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. There's a poem by uh, John Godfrey Sachs, and it continues. All of you must know the parable of the six blind men and the elephant. And very often I feel when we, uh, when we first encounter, as art historians, we first encounter a monument, no matter how much we've read about it, no matter we've, how much we've kind of uh, absorbed its history and its background and its context, we're pretty much like one of the blind men looking at something as complex as a wild elephant um, and quite untamable because the elephant itself is such a complex entity. The, the a monument uh, site is such a complex entity or an artwork is such a complex entity. This could be extended to artworks uh, in the contemporary times as well. But for me, the medieval mon monument is actually the quintessential complex art object. And this kind of complexity is not something we can cope with, with just one perspective, one point of view. So what I will try to highlight in this very initial session is learning to look and learning to understand is actually an extremely, extremely complex process. And it isn't about, it isn't simply a matter of, um, you know, having one kind of framework or one kind of formula with which you can comp comprehend something as complex as an artwork. So some of the questions that are asked in the, in the kind of preliminary blurb, what is an artwork? How do we look at it? Can we use a single frame to look at it uh, entirely? Um, uh, can we use the same frame to look at different works of art? Uh, is it enough to say, I like this, so it's a, it's a good work of art? Are we missing something out uh, by not understanding background context and looking at it as a very, very complex 
complex entity. So uh, for me, an artwork is as complex an entity as a human being. And it, uh, even once a single medieval site would probably take an entire lifetime of interaction to be uh, able to even you know, come to grips with what it might be about. And it's not possible to comprehend it. So I will again go back to Kailash because it's wonderful to use one single object, one single complex object, and look at the kind of discourses that it has evoked. And why am I going back to Kailas again? Because uh, what we, when we, we did study the methodologies, the different kinds of uh, theories and methodologies from uh, MS University of Baroda to look at various art objects, we did look at specifically with at a lot of uh, ancient and uh, medieval Indian objects because that was the strength of uh, my discipline. And we used uh, a lot of German art theory. Uh, to look at it, and I think that it's still um, a, it's it's quite relevant. Even we've expanded a lot, we've changed our frames, and um, so I will look at three ways of looking at Kailasa with again with quotations from uh, people who have written about the object from different perspectives. So this is about Cave 16 at Elora. Let me start with uh, a quotation from my. Uh, my own PhD supervisor, one of the persons who really taught me, he, 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 I learned to look from uh, Professor Deepak Kanan. And this is a little excerpt from his PhD thesis. He, he being a sculptor himself, was extremely sensitive to uh, various formal aspects and style aspects of sculpture. And he was one of the people who really taught all of us how to look at works of art, complex works of art. So this is actually from his PhD thesis. And let's look at what he says about the sculpture of Kailasha. This plays a diversity of idioms, sometimes as a result of orthogenesis and due to different origins otherwise. To gauge the stylistic developments in this particular monument, the fabric woven of these warps and wefts need to be examined. The major lineages that feed surface on this fabric are the Chalukya, Pallava, and the later version of an indigenous Upper Deccan idiom. They coexist independently and in the course of time interact with each other to result into a new synthesis. So the rest of his very complex uh, chapter on, um, on, Elo, uh, on Kailasa, which is like the culmination of his PhD thesis, really talks a very, in a very detailed way about these three lineages, the Chalukya, the Pallava, and the indigenous Deccan uh, idiom. And these, this is basically what we talk, what we call stylistic analysis, and it takes a, a very deep understanding of a kind of a mental, <clears throat> uh, a kind of a mental image of what Chalukya looks like, what Pallava looks like, and what the Deccan idiom could be, because it's not really been defined. And he was one of the first to kind of. Uh, really give it uh, a contour and a definition in this particular uh, section on, on uh, Kailasa. So the whole understanding of Chalukya, Pallava and the Deccan idiom is a way of, is, is, is kind of a memory because he's been to these sites, he's looked at them uh, over and over again, looked at photographs over and over again. So you really have to train the eye and the mind to almost diagnose these features like a good doctor trained in the old techniques before diagnostics were on where you could just look and things strike you and it's it's even difficult to articulate those things and that's exactly what stylistic analysis is still about and it's a great it's one of the most precious uh, legacies of a number of german art historians uh, german and viennese art historians that india inherited so this is what he says about the Chalukyan style. Um, you can see that uh, the first image is of Narsimha from Elora 16, and the second is from Patarakal. Um, though they are not, there is another um, Narsimha in Elora which is closer to this, uh, but I don't have the image of that right now. So we will go with these two images, and you can see that there is a certain similarity, though the stone on the right being sandstone, a much denser stone, uh, displays a slightly different quality. But 
to articulate it. That's the crux of this whole thing. All these sculptures referring to uh, the Chalukyan contribution, and he calls it the master of Patadakal. He has expanded on it on a, in a recent book. Faithfully follow the Patadakal physiognomy and style. Sometimes the sculpture spreads out of the frame on the wall, surrendering its plasticity and converging itself into a drawing incised in stone. So we see that, that expansion that we see in, um, in Elora. And you can also see that there's like various stages of relief. Um, you have a little bit of undercutting, fairly high relief, all the way to just incisions. So, um, so it becomes almost like a drawing incised in stone. And the space inside the frame is starkly neutral, just like a backdrop. The narration is synoptic. It's extremely simplified synoptic. There are many forms of narration. The telling a story in stone has so many variations across India. And the narration of uh, this particular uh, mode, the patriarchal mode, is extremely synoptic. And there aren't that many extraneous details. The movements are arrested or dramatically suspended. Uh, dramatic, uh, dramatic suspension of movement is a characteristic feature of the patriarchal sculpture, which can be seen in every relief of the Virupaksha temple in Karnataka. So it's actually amazing we don't have records of patriarchal sculptures, uh, sculptors coming in, but just because of trained eyes, people have been able to detect the, uh, the influx of, we don't have uh, inscriptional records of them coming in here, but just because the resemblances are still so startling that we can make out that there is this Chalukyan contribution to Kaila Satellora. So Ch Chalukyan style, Nataraja, one from Elora and the other from Patadakal. You can easily make out by looking at this that you need to kind of adjust for the fact that they're working with two different kinds of stone. The sandstone in Patadakal is a, uh, is a lot denser and a lot harder. And the second thing is, because it's structural architecture, on the right, you see structural architecture, monuments that are built uh, with stone after, uh, with stone built on stone, you do have, uh, designated niches in which these sculptures can fit in. So that means you don't have a whole lot of expansive space where you can do, uh, you know, you can you can make your uh, sculpture expand. But look at the Nataraja on the left. He is expanding pretty much uh, across the frame. And there is a lack of constraint to a certain extent because they're working directly in rock cut architecture, so monoliths. And so they're working directly on the rock surface. And there's all that surface to explore and to use kind of expansive forms. But you can see that the, that there's an, the pose is almost identical. And the feel of the Tandava, the arrested motion, is almost the same. So when we look at the Pallava contribution to Ellora, now moving on from the Chalukya, so which sculptures are made by the Chalukyas? There's clearly identified in this PhD thesis, and they have other people who worked on it too. And who contributed, who, what was the Pallava contribution? So they had artisans coming all the way from Tamil Nadu as well to Elora 16. And what was the Pallava contribution to uh, Kailash? It was a huge royal monument, so they could afford to import their artisans. The Mahisha Madhini panel is rightly attributed to the Pallava guild. The conception of Mahisha Madhini itself speaks of its Tamil origin. Like her Mamalapuram counterpart, the god goddess is shown lying a, a li riding a lion and is followed by an army. Unlike the usual representation of this myth, where the goddess is shown slaying the demon, she is depicted while engaged in combat. This is like the most famous and iconic emblem that we have of Mamalapuram. The same space treatment too corresponds with the Pallava tradition, where the protagon protagonists are uh, provided with an arena which is sunk a little deeper than the rest of the relief which is invariably in low relief. So here is a comparison of the Pallava style uh, Maisha Madhini. Um, on the left, this is as part of Kailas. As, as soon as you enter, it's on, the, on your left when you, when you start the production. And on the, on the right, you have the Mamalapuram uh, Mahisha Madhini, which is like very famous. It's, uh, and while there are differences in poses and even in the conception of Mahisha, there 
there is a huge um, a huge coincidence of uh, figuration and the way the background has been handled and the levels of relief uh, which are varied in almost an identical fashion if you look at different elements and look at the way the relief has been varied from low to incised relief to extremely high relief with almost undercutting. In fact, the deepest undercut in the Mamalapuram one is lion's mouth for some strange and wonderful reason. You can see that there is also a compensation because we're talking of two different, extremely different media, basalt and granite, which is even harder than uh, basalt. Um, it could be granulite, chardonnayte, I'm not sure, but it's a, it's a form of granite, which is extremely hard and uh, much denser whereas a basalt is also igneous but it has a very different and slightly porous quality to it so and depending on which part of elora the carving could be easy or hard because the density of the stone varies a lot across the one one and a half kilometers so what is the third style so three styles go into the making of actually four styles but the third style which you see is the local and Dakini style. So these are the three that commingle with each other and form uh, Elora's characteristic um, heterogene heterogeneity. So the third sculpture uh, has, uh, has a salient uh, characteristics of Deccan sculpture. Uh, this is the, it's a huge panel of Shiva in his ferocious form with disheveled Jatabhara. Um, dancing frantically, throwing his arms in different directions. The most noteworthy fe feature of the sculpture is the of Saptamatrikas seated at the feet of the Colossus. Uh, these figures, these tiny figures at the feet of the Colossus are completely uh, unprecedented. We've not seen it anywhere else. And it is not outside of Maharashtra and it has a very strange kind of, um, kind of peculiar extruding presence extrudes into your own into your space, whereas the sculpture itself is contained in the niche. So they're not carved inside the niche, but a little distance away, seated on the ground. And these independent figures, which you see, the best and most interesting example of this kind uh, of manipulation of space is seen at Aurangabad K3, where the seated devotees are grouped into corners of in front of the huge seated. So this is a very characteristic. We've seen it in a couple of Buddhist sites in uh, in this region, in Maharashtra, and it clearly is a little conceit, a little uh, some kind of extravagant uh, gesture, which is very much local to this region. And it's also strange that they're all on the floor, on this, on the on the floor level and therefore it's as an artistic element it's absolutely startling and then uh, here i've just picked this off the uh, who abducted Parvati. So she goes on to give a little detail about the story, Andhaka Suravada triumphing over the de demon Andhaka. And uh, in the battle, Shiva injured Andhaka and the demon's blood dripped and uh, reproduced him in a thousand forms. And therefore the Saptamatrikas uh, enter into the picture to help him um, you know, collect the blood and stanch the flow. So this is the background story, the sculpture itself, that we just saw of Andhakasura. This is, as you, uh, it's one of the most striking images in Andhra, starts springs from the ground, and it's pretty colossal under the Nandi Mandapa. And she continues um, on the east wall of the Nandi Mandapa is a gigantic panel depicting Tenam Shiva standing uh, on with his right leg on Apaspara Purusha. Um, and all the iconographic characteristics of Shiva. So you can see that this is a completely different way of looking at the same sculpture. The first one looked for, uh, for its pedigree, the stylistic similarities, and characterized. There's, there's a very lovely descriptive chapter, uh, section about the density of 
uh, the body in the decanidium which talks about how um, while you have a great deal of agility in the chalukyanidium and a kind of tenderness in the decanidium you have certain heaviness it's like the body is really dense and heavy uh, it's like it's not like the bodies are fat but they have a kind of gravity and a density that's very specific to the decanidium now this is a kind of almost a felt uh, you know when you interact with the sculpture as, a, as another body this is a kind of feeling that you uh, that you sense and it's, it doesn't have an exact scientific correlate but it is very much part of um, a stylistic sensitivity in um, understanding art history so this is one way of looking at it and here there is another way of looking at ethnography you know read the background story and then you associate it with sorry you associate it with the uh, the the figure that you see in so you have the story and you apply the story to the figure in front of you and you look at the uh, there will always be minor variations because there's no standard story now there is an, another level this is called iconographical analysis this is another way of looking at the art the complex art object so you can do stylistic analysis you can do iconography which is basically having content meaning interpretation you have to have background um and there is another level to iconography which is a, a specifying how the icon which um maybe relates to a text or we know the story of is very specific uh in, in the context that in which it is represented that is to understand how the icon that we are looking at not only reflects some kind of prior text or prior story but actually uh, engages with the situation in which it was created and how it creates meaning and how it responds to the meaning created within that culture so that iconology is the next level um and it really is one of the more complex elements of uh, iconography iconography you can just do text correlation but here you have to really understand social cultural religious ritual um, practices look at st strata of society look at invasions look at so many other aspects come into understanding iconology and it's much more strictly intense than just iconography that means there is no standard nataraja no standard shiva there's no standard uh, krishna or no standard saint peter or you know it, there's, there's no standard image that uh, that exists across time each time it's nuanced redefined and reconfigured by the society that produces it and consumes it so this is the as uh, fascinating aspect of iconology and here is another very interesting for me understanding of exactly the same figure it is in some sense related to uh, the stylistic analysis but it does something quite different now let's read it the great andakasura panel of kailasha combining power mass huge size and bifurcated position is situated in a se se separate alcove um, at the ground level all is not balance and harmony as elements so i've Um, had to delete a lot of it because there's a lot of text in between, but this is interesting crux of it. all is not balance and harmony as elements do not finally come to a rest, but are subject to con continuous transformations. Two natural arms positioned near the curve of the torso stabilize the head, but create ambiguity as to whether it is to be read uh, horizontally or vertically. So, she actually Kamal Bakshan talks. about she's she's a sculptor herself and has some startling insights into uh, the formal values of sculpture she's extremely sensitive to the formal values of sculpture um this she continues an interesting response would be to perceive simultaneously the three uh, the sculpture in three ways so look at the sculpture both from a horizontal position from a vertical uh, look at its verticality and look at its uh, its torsion the the way it goes around the center in a circular fashion so the eye climbs from volume to vo up down and across the eye climbs from volume to volume along the stairway of arms so that's the radiating arms kind of allow you to leap from one arm to the other 
or the rhythmic sequence, sequence directs vision in a circular direction. So you have a kind of pinwheel uh, composition that you can either go clockwise or anti-clockwise along the upper, upper arch created by the ridge of the elephant's out, outstretched skin. Three directions vie for attention, the vertical, the horizontal, and the circular. And since no one of them is particularly dominant, the panel appears per perpetually in motion. So this kind of analysis requires the same acuity as stylistic analysis because you're comparing, in stylistic analysis, you're actually comparing a minimum of two, um, two entities, one from one style and one from another, or one from a later period and one from an earlier period. So sometimes you can get chronology just through stylistic analysis. And very often in, in the case of Indian sculpture, we've had to, and architecture, we've had to do that simply because there are no signatures, no names, no inscriptions, and so many things. So just using the eye to guide you, um, you can actually uh, detect similarities, differences, changes, evolution, and uh, influences. In this particular case, you see that formal analysis does not depend on having uh, a second uh, style or a second entity to compare it with. Formal analysis kind of standalone compared to stylistic analysis. And formal analysis really uh, revels in looking at uh, the figure in the abstract in a certain way. When we look at line, color, texture, form, composition, balance, rhythms, um, uh, and the way in which uh, any comp anything is structured. So in some sense, there is a very modernist tendency in looking at a, at a composition uh, formally. And formal analysis is, uh, is really quite, it can be quite rigorous. And I think uh, the quintessential formalists who, one of the most important formalists who came to India as, um, you know, from uh, Vienna, was Stella Cramdish, and she had an extremely well-trained eye. She was much under the influence of uh, the Viennese school, and she came and introduced formal analysis in a remarkable way. And the other person whom I find uh, who's very uh, keenly attuned to uh, very fine form is Carmen Bergson herself. And it's, it's extremely interesting how, um, at one point in time, a, form, a formal analysis uh, became um, kind of combined, coalesced with a whole metaphysical school of thought that was brought in by Ananda Kumaraswamy um, in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. So there's this whole metaphysical line which actually comes from iconography, and he brings that in. And there are a few. And working around the 1930s, 40s, who are, uh, and even later, up to the 70s, who are deeply influenced by, influenced by uh, Kumaraswamy's uh, metaphysics, the metaphysical and the that comes into art. And they integrate it in formal, and, uh, which is quite a remarkable thing, but all sometimes. Uh, can also sometimes take away from uh, what formal analysis can actually do for you. There's been a logicism about formal analysis that it's extremely, uh, formalism is extremely positivist and it's got uh, in, uh, object and but as I was pointing out, look at as a single whole entity, because you can have to take in aspects of it, which are um, which are so complex that one eye not encompass everything, and you need to take it in in chunks. And some of the chunks are provided by stylist formal analysis, iconography, and uh, stylistic uh, analysis. So here. I thought this was really interesting. Here we are talking in, in such abstractions and such uh, extremely sensitive terms, but uh, this is something that, again, I got off the net, which is a very important aspect of uh, the monument, the pragmatic aspect, which talks of water seepage, cracks, cements, bat, fungus, vegetation, and uh, um, the whole notion of conserving a monument, because 
it's all very well to talk about it in detail, but if it's bound to crumble, <clears throat> if it's uh, on the verge of crumbling and uh, you know the ground is since all that pragmatic side of um, biology and art history, and it also has uh, many consequences for understanding the material, like. A lot of art historians do learn from archaeologists and conservators what is the exact nature of the material that was used by sculptors. What is it? What did they have to worry about? What were the advantages of those? And a lot of understanding actually comes from looking at these uh, aspects of the work of art. But it also relates to another uh, explain in one. Uh, which I will kind of come to in my uh, talk about art historians, which is the whole notion of what is the what is the need to conserve something that's falling apart? Why spend so much energy and effort putting together something that's falling uh, apart with vegetation and fungus? Why do we need to conserve those monuments? Uh, improve them? Why don't we make them them up? Or why don't we just let them ruin and uh, you know fall to ruin because they might they might actually look quite picturesque. That how how do we not cement like this? You see that they're a little regretful about using cement. Yeah, so there there is a whole bunch of the whole conservation of the monument itself and monument. What are the values attached to conservation? Is really a very interesting. And it eternally debated issue, which I will also be bringing up in in the rest in the other talks and the subsequent talks. Uh, one one particular talk will uh, will deal with Alois Regal's uh, fantastic and still contemporary uh, modern monuments, and what are the values we have meaning by way of conservation so here is some bits of paint this is later paint it's not belong to the so from Edura. so these are we've already talked about one the uh, the stylistic analysis formal stylistic analysis uh, we have we can club them together or do them separately formal analysis can be separate stylistic analysis is one way of looking at it another uh, blind man can op open his eyes to iconography so there is that aspect of it. And there are also other frames for looking at art, art historical objects, which include patent studies, which is huge at the extremely uh, productive from, I think, the 1980s approximately. And a lot of documents, especially for medieval art, a lot of documents are being uncovered even as we speak. And uh, there's a huge interest in. So patronage studies are huge. Even in the case of Ellora, um, there's been a couple of uh, copper plates, which uh, an inscription and a copper plate, which really tell us about the patronage of Kailas. And from there, we can gauge how many years it might have taken and what was the intention behind it and so on. So patronage studies is huge. And without patronage studies, you really cannot understand some of these grand imperial monuments, which are not just people getting together and doing something, but uh, took tremendous amount of political will that kind of um, pushed the aesthetic effort that went into doing this. That is, then there is an interesting aspect of uh, Indian art, which we don't find in a lot of other forms, but depends, depends if you look at say medieval art or you look at um, art and so on. There is a lot of interesting textual correlation, which may or may not lead to iconographical understandings. So in, in the case of India, we look at <clears throat> Shilpa texts or Aganic texts and so on to understand um, textual sources, to understand why a certain uh, iconography works in a certain way, or what are the forms of architecture that go into um, the variations that are found within a certain dynastic or a regional zone. So, uh, very often 
uh, correlating with texts. Texts might be made after the works are done, or they might be simultaneous with them, but they're anyway part of, an, uh, part of a certain culture. And if we find a text from a certain culture, it's definitely worth looking at those texts, those uh, canonical texts, which kind of lay down the rules for architecture and sculpture and religion and ritual, because that's a tremendous source of material as well as confirmation for a lot of theories that we float when we look at works, works apart, and it's especially important in India. Then studying guilds and movements and artisans, this is a relatively uh, slim area when it comes to Indian sculpture and architecture, much better for painting, because it's, it's got a longer tradition, and the, especially for the Mughal ateliers and uh, for Kangra Rajput, you have with the being able to, it's part of connoisseurship, understand artisans, specific hands of artisans. And in the larger picture, guild movements, where, where did a certain influence come from? For example, we just talked about Chalukyan guilds and Pallava guilds landing up in Anura. So guild movements. And finally, using theoretical frames, including materialism, feminism, psychoanalysis, queer studies, and visual culture, and new materials. And there's a, a huge bunch of uh, theoretical frames which are ways of approaching artworks. They, uh, they, they are kind of framed outside art history, but they've also been uh, very much part of art history for the, from the period of new art history onwards. And uh, they give us tremendous insights into looking at um, works of art. Having kind of told you about the different blind men looking at elephants or sighted men looking at different parts of this uh, this complex object called the art object it's not like they are uh, they're distinct areas uh, they, it's not like they're hermetically sealed little compartments and you cannot uh, cross boundaries to uh, use multiple approaches multiple methodologies of theoretical formulations very often uh, somebody studying a complex monument in detail uses more than one or very often uses a theoretical frame and then uses uh, multiple aspects of um, guilds, movements, artisans, patronage studies, and so on to um, to kind of create, understand the object in a more comprehensive fashion. And none of us does a single thing anymore. We are always doing multiple. We are looking at it from multiple points of view, and <clears throat> that's why I do think that the blind man and the elephant. Um, metaphor kind of applies to this. You need multiple points of view. So very briefly, um, Amita, would you want to get on to this? Because I've got another five minutes left, if that's okay. Um, would you like me to do that? Would, would you, or yeah, would you like to continue? To no, or? just just to say what the rest of the thing is, because it, it's fine. It, kind of connects very well connects with, yeah. so i yeah 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 so for for uh, uh, before she goes on to the second portion um uh, sharda uh, is going to be holding um a session of um six more um sorry let me just get on here six more um series that will be uh, starting from Thursday, this coming Thursday. And she will be holding every Thursday for six weeks, a session on the German legacy, which is what she's going to go on and talk about. Uh, this is a part of uh, a, a conversation that she uh, has started today. Uh, she will talk about uh, and talk of Winkelmann, a tryst with Winkelmann. She will continue with um, talking about Wolflin. So from uh, form to style and back again is what the second uh, session uh, post this one will be. Um, she will explore Erwin Panofevsky's reading visual art uh, like Panofevsky's. Uh, I don't think I pronounce this <laughs> correctly. Um, uh, but this is uh, an interpretation that she will follow of the ancient and, uh, and applied to the ancient and medieval Indian uh, sculpture. The next session will be revisiting regal uh, monuments, heritage, and value um, in the context of the World Heritage Site uh, nominations. 
the session after that would be images, image hauntings and Warburg's Nachleben, which inspire an art historical excursion into the world of revenant images in India. Uh, this creative take of Abby Warburg uh, is a core theory uh, voyages across multiple visual cultures and temporal locations with India as the primary port of discharge. Um, and the last session on July 23rd would talk about, would reflect Walter Benjamin's um, uh, startling essay in the context of aura lost and found. Um, and it is titled Remembering Benjamin in a post oratic World. Uh, these are sessions that will start, as I said, from next Thursday. Um, she, uh, Sharda Natarajan, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 uh, uh, she'll be holding them. And there is a registration required at the end of this uh, talk and, and question answers. There will, be, there will be details that you will see on the slide as well as us mailing it out to you. We look forward to having you for the next uh, six sessions as well. And uh, the switch is being made here um, by Sharda to the to the um, the German connection. So uh, thank you, Sharda. Uh, if you're yeah. ready to take us further, look forward to that. Thank you. Yes. Is my screen share continuing? By the way, I'm sorry. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. So I'll go on to this part, the slideshow. So. Uh, this is really about uh, where I bring in the German connection uh, to looking at uh, the medieval Indian monument because I will be using that for four of my uh, subsequent sessions. But for the last two, I'm going to spread outwards and look at uh, other manifestations, including with popular visual culture. So at this, uh, just a disclaimer about images. All the images that I've used are my own images or from Wikimedia or Wikipedia Commons. And the own, there are about a couple of them which I've used which I don't belong to them. And those have been uh, acknowledged on this site. It's mostly uh, British Library or um, sites like that. Yeah, so Winkelmann, the public domain images, all of these. Uh, the first uh, art historian that I will be dealing uh, with on in the coming on coming Thursday will be Johann Joachim Winkelmann, um, a very important uh, German art historian, uh, sometimes considered the father of modern art history, though I'm suspicious, quite suspicious of parenting metaphors. And uh, he was both a German art historian and kind of pioneered uh, certain methods in archaeology of the 18th century. Um, and his early training, strangely, was in theology and medicine. He belonged to a very poor family, and he picked up this passion for Greek classics and uh, teaching the Greek classics. Abandoning theology and medicine, he <clears throat> went on to, uh, be uh, because he was fascinated by Greek and Roman sculpture, um, and there, there were not like huge connections in Germany. He decided to move to Rome. He turned Catholic and he moved to Rome in, uh, in 1755. And um, he was quite an influential person, I mean, kind of cultural figure there. So he started off as a librarian and also as curator of personal collections of many Roman homes and cars and the aristocracy in Rome. And uh, he, till he finally was appointed in 1763, he was appointed the prefect of antiquities of, of the Pope. And of course, the Pope, the Vatican had the biggest collection of um, Roman and Greek antiquities. What he did was look at, uh, he did this amazing um, compilation of, he'd been writing all along various texts, but this is his magnum opus. The Geschichte der Kunst, der Altertums, des Altertums. And this is uh, translates to the history of art and antiquity. And basically, that's where he sets down this whole principles uh, by which you look at, at artworks. Um, and you are able to, through a very systematic, detailed documentation, classification, 
a descriptive method and using help from literary sources. You uh, use these kind of methods to create a chronological uh, time frame for works that don't have signatures, that don't have uh, authors' names, they don't have, uh, you know, things that you can reliably depend on. So basically a history of style based on connoisseurship and based on comparisons. And this is really what we, we have to do a lot in Indian art. And in my first session, I, I will be looking at uh, kind of comparing Winkelmann's method with um, the, the kind of gold standard method, which is still the empirical method for art history, uh, with some of the early pioneering architectural historians and art historians in Indian art, looking specifically at Fer Ferguson and Jouva the Gwe, and their techniques of uh, dating Indian architecture on the basis of a very similar kind of empirical method. There are points of coincidence and points, points of difference as well. But this became the standard way of doing an art history without, uh, when you don't have a lot of other things to help you with it. No names, no dates, no, uh, no provenance. So here is uh, the man's book, which was like, Path breaking immediately translated, and it became a kind of textbook for art history. So the second person that we look at is uh, Hanji Wolflin, important uh, art historian um, of um, Travels to Italy, 1886-87, and he published his important work, Renaissance and Baroque, which is uh, really an important series of objective formalist principles. So formalism, stylistic analysis, was carried to a completely uh, next to the to a next level by Wolflin, classifying style, and his most important work on the theory of style. Uh, was uh, the principles of art history. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the, uh, this right. Kunstgeschichtlich Grundbegriff. So that is translates to the principles of art history. All of us studied it, and it was uh, the most important uh, work on the history of style, published in 1915 originally, and then translated subsequently. So. This was a very important uh, work for us when we were students because uh, one of our senior professors dinned it into us, the polarities, the famous polarities um, of Wolflin. And of course, we rebelled. So uh, coming back to Wolflin kind of for me is a reconciliation. And yes, there is something quite remarkable in his work. He was one of the people who pioneered a kind of performative double projection technique where he would show a Renaissance work and a Baroque work. And he kind of defined Baroque in terms of its opposition to the Renaissance um, with a certain set of formalist values, including linear and painterly closed and open um, compositions and so on. So uh, I did use this for my stylistic uh, analysis section as well when I was talking about Professor Deepak Tannal's Elora showing the Chalukyan two forms of Chalukyan, two forms of uh, uh, Pallava and so on. So I kind of borrowed the double projection technique from him. And this was before, uh, I mean, this was immediately after projectors became safer. They stopped using limelight and they stopped exploding because projection was a pretty dangerous business. The magic lantern was dangerous business in those days. And uh, so I will be talking about <coughs> Wolflin's method and how it, it, it was extremely influential in stylistic analysis even today. And uh, looking at a bunch of um, art, art historians who, who looked at medieval sculpture uh, all the way to the 1970s, 80s, and um, detecting Wolfland's methods in their works, looking at Indian art history. So also the psychology of perception. Uh, Panofsky, one of my favorite art historians, because 
we were always very excited by iconography. So he grew up in Berlin and studied a whole bunch of things like law, philosophy, philology, and so on. Uh, went to the University of Hamburg and uh, he, if you notice, I say German Jewish art historian. One of my students recently asked me a very pertinent question. You've talked about a lot of art historians, but you've not talked about their religion. Why do you say German Jewish? Because it's very essential to uh, understand Erwin Panofsky's um, background and his and his flight to um, uh, to the U.S. and when when they're given the time that he was uh, in in Nazi Germany persecuted, uh, stripped of his uh, uh, University of Hamburg position. Luckily, he already had one foot in the United States because he was teaching at uh, New York University, and Germany lost a remarkable art historian, and that was uh, the United States game. So uh, his ma major contribution was uh, the very important book, Studies and Iconology, between him and uh, Abi Warburg and Fritz Saxel. Warburg's, they kind of um, defined iconology, redefined iconology. Each one had a very different uh, take on iconology and as the next step beyond iconography. So I will be looking at it in my, uh, in my fourth session. And uh, he's written a whole bunch of other stuff, including a fascinating work on Dürer. So he has written a full book on Dürer, a monograph on Dürer, and so has Wolfland. And comparing the two actually uh, gives us a great deal of insight about what a formalist can do with uh, an, an artist and his uh, work and what a person looking at it from an iconographer's point of view. Panofsky has been very influential for a lot of us studying studying in Baroda because iconology was kind of, uh, it was still a buzzword when I was studying and we were trying to understand how to iconologize our uh, approach to interpretation of meaning. So the last, Alois Rieger, I just talked about uh, when I talked of conservation and that extremely dry document uh, on conservation principles. Um, Regal was uh, foremost on my mind. I have read uh, some of his other work in translation, but I think his most uh, strikingly modern and contemporary and still relevant work, because it makes you rethink uh, art, is the modern cult of monuments. Um, so Regal belongs to the Vienna School, and they were like very formalist, positivist art historians who did not want to allow aesthetic appreciation or aesthetic tastes to interfere with what they thought of art history. And his own contribution was significant because he looked a lot at periods of art which were not considered to be, you know, iconic, not like Renaissance or uh, even Baroque was, uh, so his work on Baroque itself was uh, a bit uh, startling in those days and not ancient Greece and Rome. But he looked at the fringes of historical locations like um, a history of ornament, which is not considered high art at that point in time, uh, late Roman art industry. Uh, and he formulated this extremely important concept of Kunstwollen, which is the will art, which badly translates to will to art, which is a remarkable concept, um, quite difficult to understand because it's been misinterpreted a lot. I myself don't understand it entirely but uh, it did have a huge influence on um, people like Stella Kramdish school and definitely she kind of absorbed it, absorbed this air of osmotically, even if she was not his direct disciple. And uh, what I will be looking at is not the rest of Regal's work, but looking specifically at, at one particular essay, Modern Cult of Monuments, and looking at it in the context of a huge number of uh, conservation, heritage, value debates that have been on in India um, recently, because that really gets us thinking about what are the values we attach values according to location. So this was his 
understanding of ornament. He would follow an ornament like an arabesque across cultures, uh, across time, across um, periods. And he studied the Morellian method. He studied the Morellian method. This is a kind of extremely medical diagnostic uh, kind of method of looking at art, looking at it um, zoomed close by. And I will also be dealing with Abi Worker. Um, I don't want to go into detail right now because this is not directly related to the method that to my lecture of today. Um, I will be looking at more contemporary manifestations uh, and Walter Benjamin uh, also looking at one particular essay of Benjamin's, which was uh, the, the very important um, work of art in the, in the age of mechanical reproduction and trying to correlate it with phenomena in India, with contemporary phenomena in India. So again, looking at the subsequent sessions relating German art historians uh, to Indian art. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharda. This was an excellent walk through uh, Elora to start off with. Uh, somebody in the uh, chat has says a stunning walk through and a marvelous experience, an eye opener for many of us. Um, there are a whole lot of questions here. I'll try to club them together. Maybe we can do this for we're at 7.14 now. Maybe we can spend 15 to 20 minutes at max uh, taking these questions. Uh, but I do know that uh, Sharda is open to the fact that if we cannot deal with these questions now or some more occur to you later on, that you may please want to um, write to her on her email ID and we'll share that here or in the subsequent sessions that uh, you may want to visit uh, and attend. One of the questions that has come up here, Sharda, um, in fact, uh, your colleague talks about it, Kirtana is uh, online. Apart from trying to distinguish between the styles and have, ex have experts been able to corroborate these findings use some form of physical evidence? Uh, this is one question. I'll give you another one. Um, is there a way to estimate of estimating the number of artists that could have uh, followed the Deccan idiom? These are the two questions that I read and we'll follow up with more. Uh, could you repeat the first question? Because I didn't get the last bit of it. Um, Kirtana is asking, apart from trying to distinguish between the styles, Mm -hmm. Have experts been able to corroborate these findings using some form of physical evidence? Um, in the case of uh, medieval sculpture, probably it's, it's still in its infancy, the whole notion of uh, corroborating style with individual hands or um, with ascriptions uh, which we might find anywhere because sculpture is not uh, really famous for acknowledging artisans but I think to a certain extent it has been done in painting right so uh, in the case of uh, Mughal and later painting there, there has been some attempt at uh, kind of working at two different levels working with the style itself and then corroborating with other forms of evidence. I think it's, it's a lot more in the West than in India. I suppose we could use some like material evidences, uh, textual evidences as kind of uh, corroborative evidence to support um, what has been uh, inferred inductively by looking at style or stylistic or formal works of certain works. Does that answer your question? Um, she will not be able to respond. We have okay, put them yeah. on you, yeah. but I'm sure she can get back to you. But there is another yeah. question that I raised and then yeah. connected to that. So can you elaborate on the Deccan idiom is, is one part of the question. And is there a way to estimate? Estimate the, the number of people. That's yeah, I, one actually needs to have a time frame within which we're talking of the Deccan idiom because we, uh, it is actually a speculative 
um, it's not like we have the names of artisans and a list of people and where they're trained and stuff like that. It's still, it's quite speculative. The notion of um, the Deccan idiom itself is speculative. And the fascinating thing is that uh, it's, it's based entirely on exactly what I was say, talking about, the, the notion of a sensitive eye and uh, being able to sense in an extraordinarily uh, cute way uh, how one kind of sculpture uh, differs from the other. So the, even the Deccan idiom has actually been extracted uh, in relation to um, the Chalukyan idiom, the, um, the Pallava idiom, and so on. So it's still it, it's still in some sense a conjectural uh, space. So estimating the number of artisans and stuff, I don't think we're anywhere close to it. Though there have been estimates of how many people worked on Kailash, how many artisans would have worked on Kailash, how many artisans would have worked on a particular cave in Ajanta. So those kind of estimates and how long it would have taken have been worked out uh, by uh, art historians. But what, what was the number of people involved in the guild, how many people moved around, uh, where did this, there's a lot of, it's still extremely speculative. Mm. In that connection, also, does one know the um, who the art uh, architects of such uh, monuments are, or who were the workmen or artisans, or what were the kind of uh, tools that were used? With uh, tools, we've had a fair deal of success about what uh, tools could have been used, because the chisel marks reveal uh, uh, they were pretty primitive. The tools that were used were quite basic. So you do have, uh, you, one is able to look at whether picks were used, whether a kind of single um, excavating equipment was used, whether stone was exploded with, uh, with peg holes um, and uh, in certain locations, whether cloth chisels were used, whether uh, uh, rounded chisels were used, those kind of things by looking at the evidences, the traces on the surface of the stone, especially with stone, you can actually uh, tell. Uh, a sculptor with some experience in working with stone can tell, and it's it's still a young field, and there have been a few art historians who have collaborated with uh, practicing sculptors who have actually come up with um, very interesting insights into this. And there are continuing traditions. For example, I'm currently working on Hoysala sculptors and trying to, uh, you know, trying to find uh, if there are multiple hands, different guilds, can we identify those? Are we sensitive to those? And very clearly, those techniques are still being continued, more or less in the same way, among specific artisans and in locations like Shibara Patna, where the, where the technique, whether it's a continuity or a revival, I'm not sure. But we can assume that that was exactly the way it was done, even in the voice of the hands. Yeah? Wonderful. Do we know, Sharda, who was in charge of the design or a concept of a, of a sculpture? Would that be the patron? Would that be the artist? Would a tradition dictate that? Um, mm -hmm. Is there a process by which such a, such a brief was passed on to the, to the sculpture or the people who were actually doing it? And were they paid for it? Very interesting question. Uh, almost in all locations where we have details about artists and artisans in the context of in, uh, ancient and medieval India, where we do have some information on artists, there have been uh, art, uh, art historians like Arjan Misha worked extensively on it for 50 years. And we do know that artists were develop, uh, divided uh, in an hierarchy. And they were also divided according to skill groups. So there would be people who would do decorative stuff. There would be people who would do uh, figuration. There would be uh, semi-skilled laborers would be, ch uh, you know, chopping chunks of stone, either excavating stone in rock cut or uh, blocking out big blocks for the sculptors to work on. So we know that there were different grades of artists. And uh, looking at specific locations like um, Odisha and Hoysala, where we do have um, a bit of documentation of artists, we have names of artists. It looks like uh, they were artists. Did have a great deal to do with the the, uh, the theologists and the people who they did pander to the uh, king and his the priestly group. If it is a royal monument or which whoever the patron was, because they were doing of course religious sculptures to a large extent. 
but they did have a free hand. In some sense, execution was their business, and they decided to leave artist camp. There, there seems to have been a divide between the artist camp and the people who paid education. They had a free hand to uh, develop uh, the sculptures the way they wanted, within huge constraints, but they did have a free hand. And it was done hierarchically. The sutradhar or the master sculptor would be the one who dictates what happens. And uh, many names like Oja and Acharya we come across in, in um, Hoysala. And they were clearly the master sculptors, the teacher of the sculptors. And they would dictate the iconographic plan. They might do the drawings. They might do the finishing. They might do all the important works like the Garbhagriha icon. But, and they would be in control of the overall, there are specific hierarchies who are the engineers and so on. So this, there's an hierarchy and the hierarchy uh, controls how the work mm -hmm. is done. Right. And almost right. Right. Um, what are the, um, I think we can take one or two more questions before we close. What are the, uh, is that okay with you, Sharga? Yeah, can sure, sure. Questions? What Definitely. are some of the conflicts uh, that may surface uh, between, uh, say, the German way of looking at art um, uh, that may be born out of a very different tradition altogether, mm -hmm. uh, say, their art, uh, ancient and medieval art, versus the, the, the people that you're going to talk about mm -hmm. uh, who, who are talking about the ancient and the medieval art in, in our tradition uh, right. with, with our kind of uh, issues and conflicts? Right. How does that, how does that compare? How do we resolve the two? How does that, yeah, how, how does that uh, uh, co conflict, yeah, how do they res resolve the two? That's correct. So, um, I just, since I'm looking at uh, Winkelmann, Wolfram, Panofsky, and so on, I'm just kind of using them as a launch pad to look at uh, similar operations that are there in Indian art. I'm not trying to, um, draw, you know, overly um, overlapping parallels because there aren't any, because we're, there to, we're talking of different circumstances in which uh, they were working, researching and writing. Mm. Uh, but there are definite overlaps and especially at the level of approach and methodology. Uh, we've learned a lot from uh, a huge number of Western art historians, including the huge German contribution. So that's the only reason why I am actually using these people as a point of departure rather than uh, uh, you know using them as a kind of template uh, into which Indian art historians fitted themselves. That doesn't work. Mm. So so the correlation is is loose. It's not it's not like okay. tied up. Yeah. There's one question that uh, talks about we know that Roman busts were painted with vivid colors. Mm -hmm. Are there instances of Indian sculptures being painted? Definitely. Uh, we've also, it's, it's um, we've been trying to imagine what it would have been like to have painted sculptures. There's many locations where there are uh, traces of plaster and paint, including Elora. And there is reason to think that it was part of an original plan because uh, the basalt was, is not, um, you know, at the moment, it doesn't look very attractive. So it's very likely that they were originally plastered and painted. But the, in Elora, there's also been this problem of a in between, uh, uh, you know, the, a, a change of plans when with Ahalya by Holkar uh, and uh, the, them taking over that whole site. So we don't know if the bits of plaster and paint that we see are today's. It has been analyzed, and there's been a lot of interesting chemical analysis of the plaster in Elora. Other sites too, we find evidence of plaster and paint. So uh, what we think of as pristine gray or brown or uh, you know buff orange sandstone sculptures might have actually been vividly painted, but perhaps not in the same way as uh, you know the Nerolac and uh, acrylic paints that we see today on the Gopurams. That has been a bone of contention among a lot of art historians and uh, conservation conservationists, saying that we cannot use those colors. It would have it would have not been the original way it was intended. So yeah, we're talking of a very different aesthetic. Um, okay. 
one last question. Mm -hmm. um, Krishnamurti asks, the State of Conservation Report, UNESCO, mm -hmm. talks about a meeting that happened in 1998. Mm -hmm. Is that for real? Is there something that has not happened? I mean, is that, is that a typographical error or is this something that happened in 1998 and not since? I don't... I don't know uh, much about what the con this oh. detail uh, about the conservation details. I'm just okay. interested in conservation controversies, uh, like okay. fights between local communities and uh, this thing and the government or the ASI versus you know the religious endowment boards. I think those are very fascinating, showing different value systems. Yeah. So I don't. I'm not much of a conservation specialist. Yeah. All right. All right. So there is, I said the last, but this might be even, even very interesting to look at. Were there mm -hmm. women among the artisans during that period? Precious few, but I know definitely of uh, one woman uh, who's, uh, who's mentioned as part of the, uh, of the Konarak project. Mm -hmm. She was embroiled in a love affair, she's a sculptor embroiled in a love affair there's a bit of a scandal and she got back to sculpting and we do have uh, evidences of other women artists from their names usually but also uh, a woman artist who's the dog i don't remember the location but i've just been looking at uh, this rn mishra talks in detail about a few women artists who were engaged in sculpture but there is this whole uh, amazing tradition of looking at why women did not uh, become professional artists. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Lovely. Sharda, this was absolutely beautiful, very illuminating. We learned a lot, and that's what the chat box is full of. Uh, thanking you immensely for this uh, session. Uh, and uh, they, they're, they're planning to come back to the, to the next ones. Um, Jyoti, my colleague, and uh, Satyendra Pal, who have actually done the, the technical and the content uh, putting together of this particular uh, project, uh, have put a link in the chat box for those who'd like to look at and possibly register for the series of lectures that will follow from this Thursday onwards. Uh, um, you can just click that link and go on to the, onto the uh, registration formality. Um, and um, uh, I also look forward to learning a lot from you uh, of, the, of the influences that the German legacy, as you call them, uh, had on the um, uh, concept of art history uh, in, 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 in the works of our, our sculptures here. Uh, Sharda, this was excellent. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, highly illuminating talk and this Kunst Forum and for launching Goethe Centrum Hyderabad in the series of webinars that we will carry forward. We are going to have a World Music Day uh, that will be on, on, um, on web, all online. There is a talk on cancer um, and, and the learning of, of the research st status of cancer. Uh, and there are many more that will follow. Look forward to having you all with us. Um, and uh, thank you, Shada. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Amita, and your wonderful team for putting this together.